grow our footprint uh, globally and locally. Okay, let's go to other opportunities that have presented themselves during COVID. Dr. Masangu, you believe that COVID-19 pandemic's effect on the South African economy presents an opportunity for the ICT sector to reset. Indeed, uh, Ms. Kunta, what, we, what we've experienced um, is that there's been high level of innovation. We've seen both the capabilities of the private sector and those of the state being brought to bear to disrupt the, the pandemic. So, for instance, from our side, um, from the telecom group, we've made our experts available, our data scientists available to the government, who have then worked with the National Department of Health and have developed a solution to track the disease. And we've seen the highest level of collaboration between the government and ourselves on that. But more than that, we've also seen how agile and resilient our private sector can be. We've, we, instead of shutting down completely, we've seen the economy moving from the central business districts into our neighborhoods, where you would have to run your standard banks, your big corporates from the comfort of your home. Well, if you call it comfort. But that's when then us as telecom and our, um, our counterparts in the ICT sector have had to provide the connectivity and the necessary backbone for the economy to stay resilient. Mm -hmm. Stefano, you're the only holder of petroleum production rights in South Africa. What does that actually mean? And can you take us through the journey that you've taken in South Africa from 2012 until now and the opportunities and challenges that you've faced? Uh, yes, so the, being the, the only holder of a petroleum production right means that as it stands right now, we're the only company in South Africa that has a license onshore to be able to extract natural gas and then to refine it and sell it. Um, the, the, the journey has been, has been a particularly long one. Uh, the production right was awarded to the company in 2012, and if you consider from the time that the production right was awarded, through to the time that first gas will actually be sold commercially on a large scale, it'll be 2021. So I think that is probably a key takeaway message that you know, South Africa as a country needs to grasp and to, to really tackle if we're going to be serious about bringing natural resources in the energy space online. Um, there, is, there, there is a lot of red tape, there is a lot of difficulty in terms of getting things done going just from being permitted towards actually going into production. And you know, the, this journey that we've been on of, of yeah, nine, almost 10 years, doesn't even capture the, the almost eight years before that in getting the production right. So although it's great that we're making all of these gas fines, to turn them into production rights and then to turn them into production, it's a very, very, very long, slow process. And you know, one, of the, one of the key takeaways for me at, uh, at last year's event was, the concept of doing away with a lot of red tape, and I think that this is this is critically important. That does need to that does need to uh, need to reduce significantly if we are going to bring these assets online. I think the the other you know so that's the negative side of it. The positive side of it was that I still do believe that South Africa is massively naturally endowed with some fantastic opportunities. And when we bought this thing, and you know, if if anyone had watched uh, watched Carte Blanche, you know. We, we were the asteroid guys. Um, the, the point is, is that what we ended up buying in 2013 and what we ended up with were two fundamentally different companies. Um, there was a little bit of natural gas over there and we were gonna do a tiny little power project and then along the way we discovered helium and helium being as critically important as it is to the world. Um, we then partnered up and, and I see Ambassador Marks in the audience over here we partnered, and we partnered up with the American government and we've turned this into a real world-class helium project. And this is important because if you consider a, a large portion of the world's helium has just disappeared. Um, it, it's run out. And then you consider its uses in medical, you consider its uses in rocketry, in uh, technology. This conference would not be possible without helium. You can't make cell phones, iPads, iPhones, none of that technology exists without helium. Um, a cute little anecdote is Falcon 9 took two million party balloons to launch it. 
So, you know, that, that this, this is a critically important gas and it's run out. And when you consider that prior to our discovery, the richest concentration on the planet was the United States with an aggregate of 0.35%. Now, 0.35% is good. You are a rock star at 0.35%. Our last well clocked in at 12%. And that is because where we are, it was struck by a large asteroid two billion years ago and set off this, this cataclysmic set of events and, uh, and actually also helped shape the gold basin and the platinum basin, and this is why we have so many minerals that we do. So basically, in a nutshell, we're mining an asteroid, which is really cool. But South Africa has a lot of opportunity. It really does. Um, I think that there are a few issues that are not insurmountable that we need to, that we need to address. And I believe that with the right collective effort, we can address them and we can turn this into, uh, we can turn this into a, a, a premium investment destination. Mm -hmm. um, our, our little project by itself, we pledged last year 750 million rand. Of that 750, over 650 million came from foreign investment, foreign direct investment. It wasn't domestic. That just gives you an idea of how much of an appetite there is to see the South African story take off. Okay. Stavros, the issue of red tape and sometimes difficulty doing business has been raised. It's in the economic recovery plan as well, trying to cut down some of those obstacles. But I'd just like you to share your experiences because you've also experienced that. No, thanks very much for, for that question. I, I think let me, predi let me predicate what I'm going to say by re red tape is probably something you encounter in virtually every market. I, I think the, wh what you learn quickly at Aspen is we, we're in over 60 markets globally. And uh, red tape exists just about virtually in all of those markets. It's, it's the degree and the extent of the red tape. But more importantly, when that re red tape presents, how do you deal with it? And uh, our, uh, our investment that I, uh, that I represented earlier, um, I, I must say, has been a pleasant experience because we've encountered a number of regulatory obstacles, including with uh, the Drug Regulatory Agency, SAPRA, and, and others. And I, I think what has happened with these investments announced at, the, at this conference and, 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 the, and its two predecessors is there is a dedicated team in Minister Patel's office. When you hit those obstacles, you, you make contact with them. Most cases, they are resolved. There's the odd thing that doesn't get resolved and needs a little more effort. But I think the experience generally has been a good one. It would be great if we could amplify that, amplify maybe the, uh, the facility that's available um, through Minister Patel's office to also pervade to other projects because I think that will send the right type of message to, to overseas investors and also to domestic investors. I think there is an inclination that we are red tape heavy in our country, and I think that we've got to build on some of the success stories, like ours has been a pleasant one. Um, it's no mean feat that in two, two years to get your first production of anesthetics hitting Europe next January, so it's been a 24, 25 month period. And a lot of it's been achieved because we have been able to fall back on that facilitation that DTRC uh, represents. And I think we need to build on that as a country and also amplify that message. Dr. Masangu, um, what opportunities would present themselves in a South African context if high demand spectrum and frontier technologies like 5G and AI implemented for the mining, financial services and manufacturing industries, among others? I'm just trying to look ahead beyond the challenges that we're currently facing now. Yes, um, 5G is a very important development and we should not look at it as 4G plus one uh, because 5G will bring lower levels of latency, higher speeds. So basically if one would use my own analogy um, is that you're moving from social internet to industrial internet. What uh, the clip we saw earlier about what is going to be done at the Venetia mines, if my memory serves me correctly, is that some of that will require this spectrum to be able to drill deeper where humans cannot reach. So you will recall that when 4G spectrum came, uh, was, was introduced, it then brought you a new and altogether new economy 
which of apps. No one at that time thought of apps as a way in which we could conduct business and life. So we know that with 5G, it is likely to bring us very things like your, automotive, uh, your autonomous vehicles, smart city applications, and so on. But the problem does not lie there. The problem lies in us as the private sector and government, or at least SA Inc, having a similar, or at least having consensus on what that 5G means. At this point, you find that international bodies such as the GSMA tells you that in order to run a 5G application, the, the, those that will bring us the wonders that we're talking about to power the digital economy, requires that you should license an operator to have at least 80 to 100 megahertz of contiguous spectrum in the mid-band, right? So in this country, that mid-band is represented by what is called the 3.5 gigahertz. In that 3.5 gigahertz, we only have 116 megahertz available for assignment. And then the regulator salami slices it. So how are we going to then enjoy those benefits of 5G? Secondly, if we look at the delays in releasing spectrum, that delay is over 10 years, 12 years. Why is there a delay from the government? If you dig deeper, you discover that there are very difficult decisions that the government has to make on the structure of the market. You have the companies that were licensed. You have about six holders of spectrum as we speak today, high demand spectrum, but only three companies are deploying that spectrum for their own account, which means in the, in the infrastructure-based competition, you actually have three players, Vodacom, MTN, and Telcom. So then we have to ask ourselves, what happened to the other companies that were licensed? Why did they not succeed? And why, what is happening in that space? So that's why then, we're also saying, Spectrum must be released yesterday. But are we releasing it to the three only? Is that competition? And also when we see what the UK is doing, you'll see that they've just announced a 200 million pounds investment on 5G industrial applications. So as they do that, they're looking at rail. They're looking at, at manufacturing. What, are, what is our take on technology in manufacturing, technology in rail, technology in transport? We have not made that view as a country because we don't have a 5G strategy. We don't have a 5G policy. We, don't, we have not problematized that as the country and as society. But what we are doing, we want to steam ahead. Maybe as the last point that I want to make is that we need to be careful when we deal with Spectrum because we have to make trade-offs. Spectrum, you license it over a 20-year period. Do you want to rush and license it over a 20-year period when you have not made up your mind on the structure of the market, competition, costs, universal service and access? Do you want to prioritize a short-term gain of giving a shot to the fiscus versus the longer-term cost of, of, of connectivity and affordability? We, we need, as a country, to come to terms that it's not about releasing spectrum. Spectrum will not solve your problems by itself. As we speak today, no one is starved of spectrum. During COVID, ICASA released all of that spectrum to the operators. Have we? So we need to be careful. Even the reduction in prices that we've been talking about was as a result of Minister Patel and the Competition Commission, which tells you that there is lack of com effective competition in the mobile space. If we do not resolve that, we will still experience the high levels of concentration even in the 5G world. Okay. For me, Mr. Dr. Masango is looking forward, seeing the possible scenarios that can come and the challenges that are going to come even with the technology that people sometimes use as a panacea for everything once we get 5G right or once we get spectrum right, we'll be okay. I wanted to find out from you, when AXA is looking ahead, 
with the challenges that they're facing now, how long is it going to take you to recover? And then what other ways are you using technology and the like to pivot and buffer yourself from the challenges that you are currently facing? Thank you very much for that question. We have um, done sufficient economic modeling. Our recovery is projected to be from 2023, which is in line with global practice. That we'll see first in the domestic market, and then it will be followed by the international market in about 2024. So in a sense, what we have done is we've positioned ourselves in our recovery plan to diversify our revenues and look at other activities. Mm -hmm. I indicated the very exciting potential that is presented by the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement and the opportunities it presents us as AXA with our global footprint of providing aviation services, airport services across the continent to really be the facilitator for that trade. We really believe the long lead times in rail, in road, et cetera, do not actually, um, are not very responsive to what the trade agreement actually requires. So we believe aviation is what is going to get us out of the doldrums. And we want to be in the front of that, playing a very important role, driving e-commerce and driving technology um, and particularly innovation in the continent. We have an extensive uh, set of aviation technology and systems that we use for airports, and we are renowned to be one of the top seven global companies that actually drive the business of aviation, uh, and particularly we want to take that position on the continent. We understand there have been a lot of Chinese investments on the continent of building airports, but our experience shows that they're not very interested in operating and managing uh, and maintaining those airports afterwards. So we've carved a very clear niche for ourselves on the continent for facilitating trade and improve South Africa's position in terms of global competitiveness, in terms of uh, trade. We perform very well, nine out of 135, on the air freight facilitation, but we think there's room for improvement in all of the other areas of trade facilitation, assisted by a very robust, uh, resilient aviation sector. What is very important for us is here at home, we believe we don't want to waste a good crisis. What COVID has offered us is an opportunity to do things we were dreaming about and thinking about doing some years to come. The Aerotropolis development, which basically would be anchored on the, what we call the Golden Triangle of O'R Tambo, Cape Town International, and uh, King Shaga International Airport, is principally how we're going to evolve for this period, Whilst we're revenue strong, we're going to be doing extensive planning, and we believe partnerships are going to be quite important in this period of getting us to work with others, which we traditionally haven't. Our financial performance has been that we're quite capable of doing things ourselves, but now we need partnerships, and this platform is excellent for us to garner those partnerships to develop three aerotropoli in uh, O'R Tambo, in King Shaga, and in Cape Town. That is what is going to spur the metropolitan economic development we believe with us in the center facilitating that trade onto, onto the continent. Technology, digitization is our key competence and we believe in a sense we're going to be offering those services globally to others, particularly around the management of airports and as such in the aviation industry generally. We are looking forward to this being the opportunity through which the aviation industry is uh, rekindled and importantly with that, we would look forward, Minister Patel, to some proposal that would allow us to deal with an aviation master plan. We think the master plan uh, mechanisms have actually done exceptionally well in reinvigorating sectors and actually allowing us to focus all our capacity, bring back, bring private sector, public sector together and focus investments in a mechanism that allows partnership. We believe we can support the manufacturing sector growth, which is happening in and around our airports, but also focus it there, e-commerce. The agricultural sector by now outperforms everybody else in terms of time-sensitive goods that come out of our airports. Importantly, high-value goods are also something we want to support and provide necessary technology for security and enable the mining sector with their precious metals to actually facilitate exports. Our basic performance in terms of exports has not been significant. 
uh, it's been lower than imports, and that is something we want to ensure we're able to provide the infrastructure in two or three years' time that enables that export trade from our country onto the continent primarily, but also looking at other trade blocks, Mercosur in, in South America, responding to what the USA has to offer in the Algoa package, looking at the EU, and looking at uh, other opportunities that are presented for the South African economy to grow and export and facilitate trade through aviation. We really believe in the short to medium term, we are the only sector that can provide for trade facilitation whilst proposals and development projects are still underway on the continent, even on rail and, and other modes, even uh, port developments that take much, much longer. We are well poised and we really believe the technology exists also in the aviation sector, uh, simply with the wide-bodied um, aircraft that are now being utilized to increase uh, cargo on passenger aircraft, and importantly, would also be looking to increasing the dedicated air freight capabilities that is available in South Africa so that we are focused on cargo. The lesson of, of COVID is very simple diversify, utilize what the, the respond global market is responding to, use technology to facilitate and innovate, build resilience, and di actually diversify the portfolio. We're looking to developing airports in, as destination in their own rights, city airports in our regional airports. The Aerotropoli would be cities that actually allow for all sorts of trade to happen, and the regional airports would also look at surrounding communities and facilitate uh, trading and business, and uh, the airport will cease to be the place you go to simply just to get an aircraft to go somewhere. Importantly, mm -hmm. we'd want to bring a lot more activity so that we can benefit but also grow the economy on that basis. So, for me, it's just raised the point of perhaps pivoting how one sees a place like an airport. When it comes to pharmaceutical investment and manufacturing, South Africa is not generally top of mind for a, a place where such a large investment can be. Why is that, and why are you here? Okay, I, th I think, firstly, you're quite right in saying we, we're not known as a, as a pharmaceutical destination. We, you normally associate South Africa with mining and resources, and financial services, and a few other sectors. Uh, we've kind of backed the trend, and we, we've been able to do that because I think, firstly, any investor would look at the, at the basics. You're going to look at the infrastructure, the skills that reside in the, in the country. Do you have an enabling or a disenabling environment? And, and I know we sit back as South Africans, and we often lament some of those areas, if not all of them. Uh, but the truth is we, we do have a fairly good infrastructure, certainly in our assessment, and where we're based. We're based in the Eastern Cape. There are challenges around water that I think we need to engage on. There's cha challenges around the uh, energy security. We're aware of that. But generally speaking, when you look at what investors would look out to, for, um, I think we do, we do tick a lot of those boxes, certainly from a, as a pharmaceutical investor. I think the point to be made here, however, is if we don't diversify, deepen, and make our economy more inclusive, we, we're never going to really kickstart the levels of economic growth, uh, job creation, and, uh, and, and leveling out unemployment that, we, that we're so desirous of as a country. So I think we need to use an, an Aspen type of investment uh, to, to look at how we can deepen di diversification of our economy. We cannot forever rely on five or six sectors to carry this economy. And those economies that have been successful are those that have diversified successfully. And uh, in the same breath, I'm going to turn my attention to manufacturing. Um, this might be a good old-fashioned view here, but... Uh, manufacturing still remains one of the sectors that can have the greatest and deepest multiply effect back into the economy. It's, it's good both for, for value chains and it's also good in terms of job creation. It's, it's been demonstrated that the world over. So I think we need to place emphasis in our country on diversifying the economy. Those sectors that we think are non-traditional or have no hope of succeeding. I think we might want to relook at some of those. 
look and see where the synergies reside in the economy. So before we write off some of the SAEs completely, and I, I'm not uh, for any, not by any stretch uh, advocating any further bailouts or anything like that, let me be clear. What I'm saying is we need to start look at, we need to look at leveraging some of the synergies that exist to give a lift up to some of the other non-traditional sectors. And I think we've proven it as Aspen. It's, uh, it's, it's really great. You know, the, we normally depend on the world for anesthetics, not the other way around. So it's really great as a South African company that we now are supplying anesthetics and a good chance that if you land up wherever you are in the world and you require surgery, please God you don't, you're likely to get an Aspen product somewhere along the line. So, so stay, keep out of surgery, but if you do, there's a good chance you'll uh, land up with an Aspen product mm -hmm. out of South Africa. Let's talk about products and innovations out of South Africa. Stefano, there was an announcement that you made earlier on about a world first. Talk to us about that and the significance of that. Yes, uh, very, very proud day today. Um, after a year and a half of, um, of innovation along with, with our partners in this regard, one of the largest trailer manufacturers in South Africa, Henrid, we developed what we believe is the first absolute zero emission um, solution for cold chain logistics. So all of us buy food from a supermarket and that supermarket needs to get food from the farms to the shelves. And that means that you've got to have these refrigerated trucks and we've all seen them moving along the N1 and the N3. Now, those refrigeration trucks will typically use diesel to refrigerate the goods. And your average truck will do somewhere in the region of about 130,000 rand a year's worth of diesel alone to refrigerate that cold box. Now, that's the equivalent per truck of putting 37 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere per annum. That's one truck. Now, just to put that in context, we've got something like the 11th largest fleet of trucks on the planet. I believe that we're sitting at 377,000 trucks on our road, which is disproportionately large given the size of our economy. So the announcement that we made this morning was that along with our partners, Henrid, we've developed a solution. Our fundamental business model, aside from the helium, is selling LNG. And we sell LNG into the logistics market. So you put LNG into the truck instead of diesel, and it reduces the carbon emissions of the truck. It's a lot cheaper, the truck lasts longer, it's, it's just a, a really feel-good project. But that LNG needs to be warmed up because it's sitting at minus 162 degrees Celsius. And it can't go into the engine block at that temperature. So it goes through a thing called a gasifier where it boils very much like the water in your kettle and it changes from a liquid to a vapor. But in doing so, normally what they would do is that they would do it on a gasifier behind the truck. And very, very simply put, all that we did was that we took the gasifier behind the truck and we put it inside the cold box. And that means that you're releasing all of this cold energy where the food is, and that means that you can refrigerate literally for free. And you're not using one milliliter of diesel to cool that cold box. You're keeping it cold, zero emissions. And per truck, the combination of both that along with running the truck on LNG, if you had to do this setup, or call it 100 trucks, you would save the same amount of carbon dioxide. And then as soon as that's sorted out, then you can continue and people can hear this incredible announcement crisply and clearly. You can go ahead. I mean, the, the long and the short of it is that if you, if you were to convert 100 of these trucks onto the system, you would save the same amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as planting 300,000 trees, which is wow. quite formidable. Aside from the fact that you'd also save about 24 million rand a year in running costs. So it's a, it's, it's a good announcement. And in conjunction with our other partners, Tertel, the French oil super major, my apologies, we're going to have to cut again, and apologies for that. We're just going to fix the sound. Perhaps we can ask the technical team to come on if Stefano's mic needs to be changed. And um, while we're waiting for that to happen, are you going to use that hand and mic? Is this one working? Yeah. Yes. Um, and then the second portion to that announcement was, uh, was working in conjunction with Total. 
we have now opened up the N1 as a corridor for LNG dispensing. So trucks that are moving between Cape Town and Joburg will now have the ability to fill in, uh, to stop in at a hotel service station along the way, put LNG in their trucks, and off they go. So these are these are two major groundbreaking announcements, and uh, and it's this kind of innovation that um, that is. It should be, this kind of technology should be exported. It it really is it really is game changing. Can we have a round of applause for the innovation that is coming out of South Africa despite the challenges that we are facing continually? There is so much happening. I'd like to thank all the panelists for your time. We have a challenge of time. We want to carry on making sure that we are on time with everything. So thank you so much for your contributions and insight into your different industries. We really appreciate it. Thank you. The Nestle Escort Factory has employed 349 people over the duration of the project. Four years in development, the factory was commissioned in 2017. Electrical infrastructure has been upgraded and a spray drying tower has been installed, increasing capacity to manufacture more coffee products. The Mossel Bay Factory is reusing wastewater to reduce strain on the municipality and has since created seven full-time positions. And the Buffalo City Factory investment is upskilling for new technology, reducing waste generation and streamlining energy efficiency through their new wafer batter making plant. Newland has proudly introduced the Newland Park Rail Terminal Bayhead Durban, undertaken as a public-private partnership with Transnet. Following the substantial destruction of the premises in 2017, Newland undertook the redevelopment at their cost and risk. The initial phases have been completed, with the final phase to be completed in 2021. This project aligns with government's objectives. Newland's next planned project is a manganese terminal in Kuha. Newland and Transnet working together to grow South Africa's economy. Dalisu Holding Sodium Sulfate Manufacturing Plant is an integral development providing dust suppression solutions for the mining, detergent and glass industries. The plant is the only one of its kind able to produce sodium sulfate to the high levels of purity required by buyers. Construction is forecast to be completed within budget and has created 90 local jobs with a further 28 permanent jobs following commissioning. With 50% of local sodium sulfate requirements imported, the plant has catalyzed both import displacement and market growth. Atlantis Foundry's 2019-20 investments in new decoring machines increased manufacturing capacity. The foundry, which won the Best Brownfield Expansion Award in 2019, continues to strive for technological, social and commercial excellence and in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, retained and supported all staff, expanded its administration building, hired an additional 88 learners and supports 130 students as part of their transformation strategy. With 80 million rand pledged and all projects successfully completed, Atlantis Foundries is quickly approaching its Industry 4.0 goals. with all this COVID-19 stress that we've all been carrying this rest this whole year, it's so comforting to hear all of these business leaders talk about how well they've done. And um, it really gives certainly a lot of us some confidence about the future. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think this would be a good time to look at which companies in this room and who are watching from all over have decided they're not only going to have that confidence, but they're going to put money into the country. I think we're at that point, ladies and gentlemen, that everybody's been waiting for, and that is the time to announce everybody that has pledged their investments, at least for this 2020 installment of the South Africa Investment Conference. Now, I've got to make sure you've got the latest list there. You were busy on stage. I've got to make sure my partner is happy. Maybe I need to get your phone, Andile, then we make sure that we are you know both what? together on the list. You take this one, I'll take this one. Oh, How's that? Is that good with you? <laughs> we'll sanitize later. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me go first. From Afrimat. Wait, 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 wait. Anile, just oh, a note. Gotcha. My apologies. Please do not applaud at the end of each announcement. We have a lot of people that have pledged, and I think it would be better if we gave everybody a cumulative round of yeah. applause at the end of the proceedings. Absolutely. Cats out the bag. Afrimat <laughs> has invested three, is planning to invest rather 300 million rand in the iron ore sector in the Northern Cape. 
Anglo-African Metals is committed to invest 280 million rand in the beneficiation of titanium in Gauteng. Equites and Sandvik is investing 287 million rand in expanding its facilities and operations in South Africa. Ivano Mines is investing a further 730 million rand in the platform project in Limpopo. Lectalis is investing 100 million rand in a milk powder production plant in the Western Cape. Mapox is investing 100 million rand towards the re-establishment of a vanadium mine in Bumalanga. It's so really cool that it's all over the country, isn't it? Sundale is committing 101 million in cheese and dairy production in the Eastern Cape. Sinayo and Homesec have formed a partnership to invest 500 million rand in the dairy sector in the Free State. And Sail Ferro Alloys is investing 562 million rand in beneficiation of ferrochrome in Mpumalanga. Bradley Aviation is committing 244 million rand in the aeronautical sector in Gauteng. And Fushish is investing 260 million rand to expand its lubricants operation in Gauteng. Sassel is investing a minimum of 5.4 billion rand towards clean fuels at their Secunda plant in Bumalanga. And Clarita is investing 222 million rand in a waste plastic to oil facility in the Eastern Cape. Procter and Gamble is investing 200, a further 260 million rand towards the expansion of their diaper plant in Gauteng. Uh, Minister Guerman Tasha smiles every time I say Eastern Cape. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Utteker is investing 200 million rands to, expensing, to expanding their investment in the production of pizza and ready meals. Primax is committing 380 million rand towards the expansion of their production of snacks and potato chips. PepsiCo, fresh from a deal, is investing five and a half billion rand to further expand manufacturing capacity across its pioneer food operations. I keep on hearing President Ramaphosa saying you as we're doing <laughs> these numbers. <laughs> Unica Iron and Steel is investing 250 million rand in expanding manufacturing capacity of steel bullets in Gauteng. And then we move on to KZN. United Heavy Industries is committing 350 million rand to the establishment of a steel bar manufacturing plant in KwaZulu-Natal. Dan Gold Packaging is investing 830 million rand in a beverage canning plant in Gauteng. Score Metals is investing a further 250 million rand to upgrade their hot rolling mill and steel, steel making capacity here in Gauteng. SA Steel Mills is investing 1.5 billion rand in establishing a steel manufacturing plant in Gauteng. PG Bison is investing 1.98 billion, just short of two, in expanding their board manufacturing plant in Pitlitif and investing in a medium density fiber board plant in Boxburg. Sonar Aroko is investing 200 million rand in expanding their paper manufacturing line in Bumalanga. And Superfoot is investing 150 million rand in the automotive component sector in the Tswane SEZ in Gauteng. Mete is committing 1.1 billion rand in the automotive component manufacturing industry in KwaZulu-Natal, the Eastern Cape, and Gauteng. Minister Mantasha, Eastern Cape. <laughs> SEW, Eurodrive, is investing 200 million rand in the automation sector here in Gauteng. Amdek is committing a further 2 billion rand to the Harbour Arch development in the Western Cape. Diversity is investing 1.2 billion rand in a mixed-use property development here in Gauteng. Tukela Lifestyle Resort is a 1.4 billion rand investment in KwaZulu-Natal. Staying with KZN, Provenance is investing 100 million rand towards a development of a film studio and innovation hub in KwaZulu-Natal. Robert Jurgens Construction is investing 8.4 billion rand in property development, including a new hospital in KwaZulu-Natal. Still in KZN, Blydale Coastal Estate is investing 800 million to a lifestyle property development in KwaZulu-Natal. We stay in that province. Port Shepson Property Development is investing 550 million rand in an intermodal transport facility and a shopping mall in KwaZulu-Natal. 
real, really epic dog. Yes, that's a really epic dog. <laughs> He's investing 200 million rand in the Homestead Luxury Game Lodge in KwaZulu Natal. Akani Properties is investing 1.2 billion rand in a number of property developments in the West Coast, in the Northwest, my apologies, Gauteng and Mpumalanga provinces. Mr. Matlangu here and his colleagues at Telcom are investing 8 billion rand to expand telco infrastructure across the country. Teroco is investing a further 4.4 billion rand to expand data center infrastructure in Gauteng. Global firm Google is investing 2.2 billion rand in a fiber optic submarine cable in the Western Cape that will provide high-speed internet connectivity across South Africa. NTT Dimension Data is committing 875 million rand to the expansion of their data centers in Gauteng. MN Capita is investing 530 million rand in establishing a global delivery center in the business process outsourcing sector in the Western Cape. Nambiti Group is investing 1.3 billion rand in a multi-purpose bulk liquid storage terminal in the port of Durban. The Solar Group is investing 400 million rand in the renewable sector across the country. Solar Africa is investing 170 million rand in solar energy for large industrial consumers in Gauteng. The Giant Flag Consortium is investing another 184 million rand in an ecotourism development in the Eastern Cape. The New Development Bank is committing a further 32 billion rand towards financing of projects in South Africa. The Old Mutual Group is investing 3.6 billion rand towards a number of funds for infrastructure and other projects across South Africa. Salam Investments is investing 7.2 billion rand towards funding for small and medium enterprises and infrastructure projects across South Africa. The Industrial Development Corporation is committing a further 8 billion rand towards funding projects in South Africa. And the Belgian Chamber of Commerce for Southern Africa is making a collective announcement of 1.5 billion rand on behalf of their members. Andile, that's a lot of billions and millions that we've been throwing around. Indeed, and uh, as the bean counter here, I have done the calculation. And Shall we do a, a drum roll? I mean, you can just go ahead and do All it. right, so there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the total amount of commitments in this third installment of the South Africa Investment Conference is 109.6 billion rands. A round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Nzinga. So, <laughs> that was a lot of reading. It was a lot of numbers. <laughs> But it was good, I guess. We would rather have a long list than a short list in this one. And good to know who is investing and in what sector exactly. and where. So, ladies and gentlemen, we also have a bit of a surprise. We have a bit of a very important person who decided to step in and pop in and uh, also lend her voice in uh, supporting this investment drive that we are on. Um, it's important for us to note, of course, since inception, this investment conference has not always just been about South Africa. Our president has always been clear that it's about the gateway into the rest of the continent. And we've got coming up the former finance minister of Nigeria, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwela, who's also, of course, uh, President Ramaphosa's Economic Advisory Council member. Just to say a few words, please pay attention to the screens. Thank you, Mr. President, for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about rebuilding Africa post-COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented hardship to the world and to Africa, but it has also highlighted the importance of existing opportunities and opened up new ones that can help Africa build an innovative and resilient economy post-pandemic. Here are a few of those opportunities. First is the opportunity to digitize Africa. The pandemic has accelerated the development globally of a digital economy and society. Digitization can spur innovation and improve productivity, all of which is good for economic growth and development. Africa has been part of this trend to digital. From e-commerce to education, finance and health, digitization is taking hold in Africa. The continent's youth are poised to take advantage of this digital revolution. About 40% of them have access to the internet, which is double that for the rest of the population. A McKinsey report indicates that in recent years, Africa has seen the world's fastest rate of new broadband connections, 
while mobile data traffic is forecast to grow sevenfold between 2017 and 2022. The mobile money and e-wallet revolutions are taking hold in many countries, though the capacity for online digital payments and other types of financial infrastructure to underpin e-commerce are still to be built. The potential of digital channels for education is vast. This can help double or triple access at all levels of education and enable us to reach difficult to reach populations such as women and girls in our rural areas and urban slums. Such education is transformative, both at the individual and the national levels in improving lives and livelihoods and tackling poverty. The same is true for health. Telemedicine is already transforming the manner in which many of our young people consume medical services. For all this to work, there will be a need for sustained investment in ICT infrastructure. It is estimated that both the public and private sectors will have to spend $100 billion to 2030 for the continent to achieve universal broad broadband access. Mobilizing such a sum of $10 billion a year is an important investment opportunity and South Africa can be the bridgehead for this. Second is the opportunity to transform Africa's undiversified commodity dependent economy, expanding and deepening manufacturing investments that can industrialize Africa. There is tremendous potential in adding value to commodities being exported in the and in the process, creating millions of good jobs for Africa's young population. Very importantly, through the African continental free trade area comprising all of Africa's countries, there will be a consumer market of 1.3 billion people ready to absorb these manufacturers. And some sectors have potential to also uh, manufacture for this market. Africa imports almost 90% of its pharmaceuticals and spends 45 to $60 billion a year on food imports. The disruption to supply chains for pharmaceuticals and medical supplies and equipment that occurred during the pandemic has shown that it makes sense for such a large continent to develop some manufacturing capacity in these sectors in order to build resilience. Third, two thirds of Africa's infrastructure is yet to be built. There are estimates according to the AFDB and the World Bank that it will take investments of 130 to $170 billion a year for the next decade in order to provide the roads, rail, ports, electricity and broadband capacity needed for a modernizing post-COVID Africa. Infrastructure remains a huge investment opportunity on the continent, but it cannot be business as usual in the new infrastructure investment era. There's a chance to build sustainable, resilient infrastructure that is climate friendly and environmentally conscious that, and lowers carbon emissions. Greening infrastructure investments in post-COVID-19 Africa can indeed be a way to build the continent back better. Thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Ngozi for those kind words and also put into perspective for all of us the compelling investment opportunities that exist on the continent and also, I guess, some of the opportunities that we may not spend a lot of time thinking about that come from COVID-19, especially the one that talks about the infrastructure um, opportunities. We've now come to the end of the formal proceedings, ladies and gents, of the 2020 South African Investment Conference. We've debated, we've discussed, we've had our three panels, and we've also celebrated the 109.6 billion rands of investment pledges. Uh, personally, Mr. President, I wouldn't mind somebody just signing a 400 million rand a check just to round it up uh, to 110 billion. But maybe that will happen between the time you come on stage and the time we wrap up. In fact, it is now time for me to invite you to please come on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming right back on stage the President of the Republic of South Africa, President Ramaphosa.
Thank you, Program Director. And thank you to all of you for your participation to this uh, third investment uh, conference, which has now come to an end, sadly. Sadly, because you all seemed to have, be having so much of a good time talking amongst yourselves and discussing all manner of things. In many ways, this has been a gathering filled with a great deal of promise, but also underpinned by a great deal of optimism. Not a single one of us gathered here exhibited any form of pessimism. It was all about a future that is pregnant with great possibilities. It has also been a very practical conference, conference focusing on numerous opportunities that exist in our country, in our beautiful country, the challenges that investors face, and the measures that must be taken to address these challenges. I think all of those were discussed, and they were discussed very openly and honestly. The world is facing a very difficult time. We are still very much in the throes of a devastating pandemic that has thrown global markets and economies into disarray. Tough decisions have had to be made on investments, on the expansion of various economies and on entry of various companies into new markets. It has therefore been significant that you've all come here, both in person and virtually, to show that this is a country, this South Africa, a country that you do believe in and want to see succeed. The plenary and breakaway sessions have taken place in the spirit, as I said, of frank and honest dialogue. I was interviewed by up to three TV stations whilst the breakaway sessions were going on. And in all of those, there was honest, direct, and very tough questions but they were all seeking answers on what the future portends. But your engagements here have been driven towards solutions, solutions that are also sought to give to those who were inquiring during the TV interviews. There's been an appreciation of the work that has been done to address the challenges of the past and broad consensus on what needs to be done to move forward. And I think if there's anything that can be said about all the social partners who participated in drafting the reconstruction and recovery plan, is that all of them collectively participated in a very transparent, in a very honest dialogue that has led to the plan that we have. This year's investment conference has in the main been about one thing, and one thing mainly, implementation. And it is correct that we are focused on the issue of implementation, which we are, as I said in my initial address, going to be focusing more and more attention on. But it has also been about new investments, about companies that are looking beyond the pandemic 
to invest in a growing economy. I'm therefore immensely pleased that so many companies, some of which the names we never knew, never heard of before, have come forward and have come forward boldly, transparently, and determinedly to make their announcements even during this period, difficult period of COVID. There must be something that they are seeing in the future of our country. So I'm really pleased to announce that here today that we are firmly on track to meet our five-year target of $100 billion in new investments, which translates, and I don't know whether Minister Patel has actually done the conversion in terms of where the rand dollar exchange is, but we will stick to the 1.2 trillion rand. In this, the third year of our conference, 50 companies have made investments commitment to the value of, as you heard, 109 billion and 600 million. And uh, program director, you're absolutely right. I do wish I could wave a magic wand and get that one or two companies to say, we will round it up for you, Mr. President, and make it 110 billion. But be that as it may, this brings the total value of the investment commitments over the last three years to 773.6 billion rand. It is a whooping, whoopingly huge number, and you should applaud yourself on that basis. Now, this represents about 64% of our five-year target. This year's conference stands out for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is taking place in an extremely subdued economic climate. In fact, we didn't even begin to think that it would come up to 109 billion. We thought it would be far lower than that. There were, there were times during the height of this virus when we asked ourselves whether we should even have an investment conference. In the end, cabinet decided that we should. And that risk has paid off because some 50 companies have come forward and have said, the show must go on, even as our country is going through great difficulties. And we're holding this conference during, as I said, difficult times. Because to secure investment commitments of over 100 billion is a remarkable achievement in this particular climate. Secondly, we are seeing significant numbers of smaller, good quality investments in the manufacturing sector, which is a priority for our recovery. A number of the new announcements are from companies that have made investments in previous years and are now expanding and upgrading their facilities and operations, which, by the way, in return, is going to lead to further employment, further exploitation of new markets, and therefore the opportunities keep growing. Thirdly, several of the investment commitments made at this conference are in sectors that have been severely hard hit by COVID-19, especially the tourism and hospitality industries. And we've heard them stand up here, well, as announced, making commitments of hundreds of millions of rands, even though they've been in a hugely subdued type of environment. These investments will go a long way towards the recoveries of those sectors. As in previous years, the breadth of investment 
showcases the diversity of the South African economy. We've always said that we are a diverse economy, and today, listening to the names of companies that one never heard of before just proves the diversity of our economy. This year's announcements include both Greenfield and uh, expansion projects across the country. They range from advanced manufacturing to the automotive sector, from agro-processing to oil and gas, from mining to tourism and hospitality, from the green economy, which is very important, to telecommunications. So it's a very broad spread and a beautiful and wonderful spread. By bringing investments directly to where people live and work, economic activity is stimulated and opportunities are broadened. Automotive plants are being built as we speak. Data centers have been opened. Ground has been broken on new factories and facilities. Some of them even bringing during the period of the pandemic, as I said initially. Investment brings hope and opportunity to those who need it most, and those are the people of our country. This is the time when we need to be beaming hope and confidence to the people of our country. And it also makes a real difference in the lives of ordinary South Africans out there. We've also seen how companies are plowing back into the communities in which they operate. The stories of a number of companies of how they have embraced community investment, how they are working with, com with uh, communities to invest in people, invest in communities, is something that is quite impressive indeed. Companies are paving streets and improving sanitation, working with local governments in a number of areas, and a number of the companies that have made those commitments are doing precisely that. In the far-flung areas of our country, in the rural areas, as well as in the peri-urban and in the urban areas. They are also building schools, they are building clinics, and they are also building housing for their employees. This is what underpins the investment process that many of the companies are going through. It's not about just the public effects of the announcements here. We know that some of those companies are involved in serious community upliftment. They are also establishing training centers to grow a new generation of skilled young people. And they see the benefit in skilling our people and giving a lift, a real spring in the heels of young people by ensuring that they get skills. Now, given the difficulties and the turmoil surrounding us, this conference, in my view, has been a great success. A great success because We've been able to get some 1,700 people to participate across our country and across the borders of our country. I do wish to thank all of you who are here in attendance and for those who are also participating on the virtual platform. And I also wish to thank those who have made commitments, investment commitments uh, today we thank you dearly because we never really expected that we would hit the 100 billion mark. I also wish to thank those companies whose generous sponsorship has made this conference possible. And I want to thank Telcom, Naspers, Anglo-American, Huawei, Discovery, and Vodacom for the sponsorship that they gave us. Let's give them a round of applause and thank them for that. 
I also wish to thank those who've been working for months preparing for this conference. It has taken quite some doing. We may think that it was a walk in the park, but it isn't if you have to put up a conference of a hybrid nature like this. It does take some doing. And Minister Ibrahim Patel has to be thanked, as well as members of the Ministerial Steering Group or Committee that has met he, Minister Patel, working with other ministers, I'd like to thank you for having been committed to this task. Uh, not that I never thought you would pull it off, I expected you to pull it off, but thank you very much for having achieved this magnificent outcome. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our advocates, our advocates for investment, our investment envoys, who play a background role, but who interface quite a lot with many of you as investors, and also interface with those who are doubtful investors, investors who, sit, who are still sitting on the fence, who have not yet made up their minds. I really want to thank them, because quite a lot of what we achieve and have achieved in the past three years has been largely due to the work that has been done by our investment uh, envoys. And I really want to thank Jaco Marie for all the work that you've been able to do. Pumzile, Elangeni, Trevor Manuel, Tabisi Jonas, Jeff Khadebe, Derek Hanekom, and Elizabeth Tabete. Thank you very much for all the work that you've put in to make this possible. I also want to thank Rinosi Mukate, Dr. Rinosi Mukate, uh, who sits on uh, the President's uh, Economic Advisory uh, Council, who leads that council uh, of a number of people across the world, and who works with uh, uh, our sister Ngozi Iwela Okonjo, uh, who leads them uh, with a very good, steady hand I'd like to thank you for keeping close to the processes that we are involved in. Uh, you are indeed a steady hand, and uh, I'm very proud to have you as part and the leader of the Investment Council. Thank you very much indeed for being here as well and for participating in all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Trudy Makaya my economic advisor, and the organizing committee and all other government departments, the agencies and entities that have been part of this outstanding work. We thank you. We would not have been able to hold this type of conference during these difficult times without you. And most importantly, I'd like to thank our social partners in organized business, in organized labor, and in the community constituency. Uh, I'm rather pleased that uh, at this year's conference, uh, you've made your voice heard, you've made your presence felt, and I'm rather glad that this is the way in which we should continue doing things, just to show that our compact uh, goes beyond just uh, writing on a piece of paper, but it actually can be turned into real action. And I'm glad that we've got partners like yourselves who are action-oriented and who will keep on, yes, reminding us as government that we should focus on what needs to be done, implementation, and will also criticize us whenever we fail. Thank you very much for being here and for your participation as well. Now, this third South Africa Investment Conference has given us confidence and hope in the midst of a dreadful pandemic. Our people, like people across the world, have endured much this year. This conference, in my view, strengthens our conviction and our resolve that we shall overcome this crisis and that the years ahead will be better, they will be brighter, and there will also be more prosperity for all. With your support, I'm firmly, we are firmly on the road 
to recovery. Yesterday, last night, I spoke to President-elect Joe Biden and congratulated him for the magnificent results he has thus far achieved. And one of the things that he said was that he is going to be committing time and effort to work with our continent, make sure that the interests of our continent are aligned uh, with interests of progressive nations in the world. And he also said that he remembers South Africa very fondly, having been here many, many years ago, and he's looking forward to working with us and ensure that we do have prosperity. And that, for me, was the most pleasing conversation because we will be able to work together as we build our African free trade area uh, market uh, to interface and also to, to deal with the biggest economy in the world. This could not have come at a more welcome time. So I see prosperity written all over our country. I see us being able to embrace one another, to hold each other's hands as we move forward and deal with the challenges, the challenges that stand in our way and overcome those challenges. And fortunately, we've got a great deal of partners on our continent and we've got a great deal of other partners across the world. Let's move forward and implement our plan and make South Africa a successful and a prosperous nation. Thank you very much for being here at this conference. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies first. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. Take care. I'm still going to find that 400 million, I promise. Cheers, President. Another round of applause for our President, please. And that brings us to the end of the third South Africa Investment Conference. Thanks so much for your time, your insight, your attention. We really appreciate